Dawson will be speaking about DataShield, a platform for the secure um, data science collaboration. DataShield, as we'll hear more about, enables scientists to use sensitive data in real time without the need for them to view the data. Becker is one of the PIs for the DataShield project and has been instrumental as it transitions from being purely a research project into an open source resource and community. She's currently a research fellow at the University of Liverpool developing software to share, access and visualize sensitive health data. Becker also works with the National Institute for Health and Care Research, the UK Software Sustainability Institute, OKRE, which brings together the research community and the entertainment industry, and the R Software Foundation. And in 2020, Becker was named on the Shore Trust Disability a Power List as one of the most influential disabled people in Britain. So as Anna mentioned, after uh, the talk today, we will have some time for questions. Uh, please add any in the chat as we go along. If I'm able to answer them, I will, I will endeavor to do so. If not, we'll save them for uh, Dr. Wilson to answer at the end. And so um, over to you, Becca. Thank you, Simon. Um, I will try and share the right screen. Let's see that one. Is that the presentation? Yeah, okay, cool. And everyone yes. here. <laughs> awesome, <laughs> thanks. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Simon. Um, yeah, so basically today I'm just gonna give you uh, an introduction to the Data Shield Federated Analysis Platform. Mm, my controls aren't working. <laughs> Hang on a sec. There we go. Um, so I thought I'd first of all start by setting the scene. Um, so the context in which we built and um, have designed Data Shield. So we're probably all aware of the challenges that exist um, related to the physical sharing and access to sensitive data in research generally. The one that we're probably most aware of um, are those challenges that arise from ethical, legal or um, governance restrictions. So these include data protection reg regulation that necessitates the safeguards are in place to prevent the disclosure or identification of individuals in the data um, that we process and use. Um, but secondary to that, the studies or data generated themselves may actually have restrictions um, relating to how the data is used. Um, there could be data storage implications that can affect whether it can be shared. And we actually know uh, from DataShield, we know of instances where software licenses that were used during the data generating um, process actually prohibit the sharing of that data, that onward sharing of that data. Um, and finally, there's the legal implications as well um, from participant consent, uh, the consent gained by study uh, um, around the data collection may actually restrict the onward sharing of that data with third parties specifically, um, particularly non-research organizations or in industry collaborators, for example. One of the uh, second, I guess, larger data sharing challenges stems from um, um, intellectual property concerns. So often there's a huge investment in terms of cost and time that has been spent in um, generating and curating a data set, archiving it, making it accessible to, uh, for, for other researchers. And organizations want to protect their investment and, in, and the intellectual property in that data itself. Um, I guess there's a reluctance to allow other researchers to gain all that credit and impact from a great new science discovery from um, a data set that your organization has carefully curated. Um, but in all seriousness, this is a particular concern um, in developing countries that hold these much rarer, um, certainly um, uh, genomics and health data sets. And finally, the data itself could be commercially sensitive. Um, so this could be where a commercial partner may hold intellectual property in the data that's been collected, or the data itself could be commercially sensitive in terms of, for example, um, land contamination records could influence the property market, for example. Um, increasingly more relevant um, over the last 10 years is that the physical size of data is becoming prohibitive to physically sharing it. Um, so sort of 10, 15 years ago, we would share data. I mean, certainly I've had data set delivered to me on hard drive <laughs> before, um, or you download the data um, at your institution via a secure uh, file transfer server. 
But, you know, we have to question the feasibility of giving out physical copies of data in, in an era where data sets can be tens of terabytes in size. So cross-cutting those um, general data sharing challenges um, on the previous slide, we have specific domain specific um, uh, concerns or things that affect um, the data sharing as well. So that's within epidemiology and health research specifically. So the first thing is that our analyses need to have enough statistical power. Um, and this is needed for us to draw accurate conclusions about um, a population using the samples that we're analyzing. And this is really important um, because our research informs patient care, therapeutics, the patient experience or can actually um, influence health policy. And so as such, we're a really data hungry domain in terms of not the size of the data, but we need data on a lot of individuals. And usually these data aren't held in a single um, by a single organization unless it's, for example, a national archive for data. So one of the ways in which we solve this is by working in um, collaborative networks, so multi-organisation collaborations, either nationally or internationally, um, with an agreement to share data with um, either specific individuals or authorised individuals within that network. And this brings its own challenges to satisfying um, those data protection and, and uh, legislative um, concerns, you don't have to address it just at one location, you have to be able to address it across your entire network, multiple um, jurisdictions, for example. And also each organisation will have different sort of governance, data governance protocols, different consents for data use, and, and all, all of this needs to be essentially harmonised. Um, even when you take, so I'll just give one example, even when you take the GDPR um, across the EU, different countries hold a spectrum of interpretation of this one piece of um, regulation, um, with some countries, particularly Scandinavian countries, taking a much more conservative view, for example, of whether a certain um, data processing operation is GDPR compliant or not. And ultimately, our biggest challenge in our domain is time. Um, solving all of these challenges takes time. Um, it can take um, a year or longer to set up your um, collaboration agreements, your data sharing contracts, etc. Um, and the other the other difficulty is that research itself relies on relatively short funding cycles. So the majority of um, researchers themselves are on short contracts attached to these short term funding cycles. And so it's obvious that we need to come up with you know, a much more time efficient data sharing and access. We need to come up with data sharing and access methods that are more time efficient, but that are also flexible enough to satisfy this spectrum of legislative and um, governance regulation across modern collaborative networks. So Data Shield is one of the analytics platforms that provides a solution to these challenges. Um, and um, the phrase that we use is that it allows us to take our analysis to the data rather than giving the data physically out to the analyst. Um, the Dacial platform has been co-built by um, teams in the UK, the Dacial team in the UK and the Abiba team, which is at um, McGill University in Canada. And it was conceptualized in 2009. Our first software was released in 2013, um, so we are approaching our 10th birthday next year, which will be quite exciting. Um, but one of the things is that throughout the whole design process of the software, we've adopted um, a co-design ethos. We've been valuing basically a huge range of health data stakeholder perspectives um, to influence the development of the data shield software. Um, and, and by that, I mean not only researchers that would use the software, studies that would have to deploy this software with their data, and not just the participants whose data we're going to be analysing through this, but the actual wider public themselves as well. Um, and we've actually run stakeholder engagement events in places such as supermarkets and shopping centres uh, to gather those broadest possible um, public perspectives about data sharing and data linkage for health research. And so in this way, Data Shield is really built by the sort of like research community for the community, but keeping in mind all of the stakeholders for health data. And so since the beginning, there's been this really strong ethical, legal and data governance research strand that um, runs alongside the um, development of the software and the statistical methodology work as well. 
So um, I'm going to explain now uh, in the next set of slides how Dayshield works. Um, and I'm going to walk through a typical setup or a scenario that cohort studies would use. So this is where um, the data that they've collected sits within their organization and their data is not sit in, sat in a national or a regional um, trusted research environment, for example. Although that scenario is also possible um, with data shield. So in terms of, um, I guess, an analogy of how data shield works. Um, so it's a federated analysis platform that operates, I guess, kind of a bit like a hub and spoke structure. And it's the same way as, um, I guess, research consortia are set up. So you'll have a centralized coordinating institute, and then you've got your partners at other institutes that carry out um, work together. And so in the same way, data is similar. So the hub, in, uh, the hub essentially coordinates the analysis within the whole of the data shield system. And the hub is also the primary, primary point that interfaces with both the analysts or the researchers and the um, study data itself, which are these spokes. So we're going to take a closer look at just a single hub and spoke. So we'll start with the hub. So I've um, just coloured in blue the parts that are um, what I've denoted as the hub. Um, so this is what we call the data shield client, and this sits outside of the study organization firewall, which is represented here in red. So it's outward, um, it, it's facing outwards. And only authorized users can actually um, connect onto the hub and use that environment um, to basically send their analyses um, onwards uh, to, the, to where the data is being held. And in fact, they can't just use, um, so it's, a, it's an environment that's built on the R analytic platform, but they can't, uh, the analysts can't run standard R commands. They can only use the, the commands and functions that are in um, specially built data shield libraries. Wrong way. Um, so the gray part up here represents um, one of these spoke parts. So we call this the data shield server. And there's one of these at every single uh, study site in your analysis network. And this really is the an analysis environment. It's where the individual patient data sits or the sensitive data sits. And only approved data shield functions um, can run uh, on this data. So um, uh, other than having the, uh, the individual data sitting, uh, running, the, sorry, other than running data shield on the uh, data shield analysis commands on the individual data sitting here, um, data shield also has the ability to connect out to a data source um, that is sitting elsewhere in the organization or perhaps in um, a different sort of cloud compute um, or compute storage environment. And this is common for image data and omics data, for example. Data Shield also has the ability to um, integrate with and make use of non R tools. So, um, for example, AI or machine learning algorithms that have been built in other languages like Python or Julia. Um, and an example, um, a recent example, is the uh, DS Omics package, which analyzes uh, Omics data, makes use of Plink. And Plink is a piece of software that sits outside of R, it's not native to R. Um, so um, the last thing I'm going to go through is that within this system of data shield, this is how it's structured, within the system of data shield, um, we use a variety of methods in order to preserve security and data privacy within this system. And in fact, what we actually do is we operate a number of um, active disclosure checks in real time. So this is we're checking the disclosure potential of the outputs and also during the analysis itself. So some of these examples include, I've mentioned just now that an analyst, an analyst can't just type um, any R function uh, to be run on, on the data. We've got a, a, checking, a checking system that checks whether the um, functions are approved to run on the data. We've got functions, we've got a checking system that checks the arguments of those functions as well. And only non-disclosive non information can be sent back to the analyst. Um, in fact, anything that is disclosive is actually blocked at the study site itself. 
So built into every data shield function um, are disclosure checks um, on outputs. And these are dependent on the actual functionality, you know, the actual statistical methods underlying that function. Um, so examples of these disclosure checks could include, for example, in the subsetting function, um, there's a minimum threshold by which um, a subset can actually um, be um, enacted. Um, and that is the threshold that is set by the data custodian or by the consortium. Um, it's, it cannot be changed by the analyst, for example. So it's typically uh, a, a typical uh, uh, default setting is three, so that you can't subset any smaller than three, three participants. Um, and so, yeah, so using these sorts of checks and things, um, it allows us to ensure that only non-disclosive summary statistics are returned back to the analyst. Now, um, I gave an example of a very simple function in subsetting with a threshold limit. We can do much more, um, we can do different sorts of checks to allow for um, additional types of analysis. So for example, on some of the modeling functions, we pose limits on the parameters to prevent overfitting. We'll um, limit the string length to so that you can't run a subroutine, for example, inside a function. Um, and um, as I said, all of these different thresholds can be configured by the data controller. Um, and these disclosure measures occur, as I said, at every single spoke, every single um, entity in the network that is um, essentially allowing the access to their data. Um, an important thing is that when you've completed your analysis, um, when you, you can actually use the outputs of your analysis in any subsequent software that you, you, um, you prefer to use in order to make your graphs and tables and things for publications. So that's not prohibited. So to summarize some of the key features of Data Shield. Um, so um, the instance that it's really um, used is when we want to, uh, when data isn't pooled all in one location, but data is variables are held about the about different individuals um, at different sites. Um, and so we can use Data Shield in this hub and spoke way um, to do a federated analysis across all of these different um, data sites. And so through this, we can get our statistical power that we need. Um, but one of the, I guess, niche things about Data Shield is that it not only allows us to do this sort of pooled analysis, which is, I guess, equivalent to um, a study level meta analysis, where each study uh, analyzes its, uh, does the analysis separately, and then we combine them afterwards. But in Data Shield, you can actually do individual patient data meta analysis. So that's running it on the actual individual data across all of the different sites simultaneously. And this approach actually really helps with addressing um, data heterogeneity. So, um, yeah, and then the, the, the final thing is that in the whole system, because data are not shared physically outside of the um, ownership of the data controller, and that the analysts can't view the data, the individual level data, they cannot copy it and they cannot print it. Data Shield addresses most of the strictest interpretations of data protection legislation and data governance restrictions um, that were outlined in that earlier slide. And by using Data Shield in your consortium, you can actually streamline some of your governance and data access processes because Data Shield takes account of some of those issues. So um, I've put a quick comparison of the data shield approach versus some of the other approaches that are um, sort of commonly used in the domain in terms of physical data access, I guess. Um, and I guess the most commonly, commonly used methods are um, certainly in the UK, it's using trusted research environments or safe havens. So this is where studies deposit their data into an infrastructure that's typically not hosted in your organization. It's, it's purchased from a third party. Um, the second example is a federated data network. So this is where um, you know, collaborations um, or, of organizations get together and um, they'll allow um, a staff, usually a statistician at their own site to run an analysis on behalf of researchers that could be elsewhere in the consortium. So the data is retained under their own control. And then the final example is the Data Shield Federated platform. So I'm first of all going to um, compare some aspects 
um, relating to interest of the data custodian first, and then I'm going to give um, some aspects from the perspective of the researcher. So I guess um, the first thing about um, TREs or safe havens is that they do require substantial financial investment, um, both in physical like computing infrastructure, but also personnel. Um, in the UK, there's an annual license fee for these, and it can be in the order of tens to hundreds of thousands of pounds a year um, for these environments. And um, I guess one of the things to consider is that different studies or different organizations use different TREs and they're not natively interoperable. Um, so, and, uh, and yeah, you're required to move your data into that environment. In terms of a federated data network, um, as I mentioned, you're, usually that's on your own infrastructure locally in your organization. Um, but again, different, um, I guess, organizations in a federated data network have different infrastructures and they're not natively interoperable. Um, with DataShield, it's a modular open source um, sort of uh, series of software that you can either install directly yourself in your own organization. You can also install it in your trusted research environment. It has the flexibility to, to, to fit into most, to be configured for most infrastructures. Um, and what it means is that if you are using an operating data shield, if your data is harmonized with another organization, you are then interoperable with that other organization to allow this um, uh, co-analysis across multiple sites. Um, looking at disclosure checking in the different sorts of environments. So with um, trusted research environments, typically there are manual disclosure checks that are done by um, a statistician before an analyst can actually export those results out of the environment for use in their papers. Um, similarly, in federated data networks, um, a statistician will usually receive a, an analysis script from the researcher. They'll check that script for disclosure. They'll run the script on behalf of the researcher and then check the outputs as well. Now, obviously, both of these, there's a, a, a financial implication in terms of and also a, um, the requirement to have staff that are trained in um, these sorts of disclosure checking as well. In Data Shield, we've got a series of automated disclosure checks that happen in real time during the analysis and on the outputs. Um, and while no one is using Data Shield in this way, it is possible to use Data Shield alongside a manual checking protocol as well. And what it will do is it'll make that manual checking faster because you know a set um, number of items will have been um, disclosure checked in the software itself. So in terms of data privacy and handling sensitive data, um, so TREs, analysts can view the full individual level patient data. Um, typically it's pseudonymized, but sometimes it's not. It depends what type of data it is and what the authorization is. But it doesn't really um, stop anyone or prevent anyone from taking screenshots or copying that information off the screen. And so it could be considered perhaps not so suitable for sensitive data, for very highly sensitive data. In the UK, this is the primary way to access data from um, primary and secondary care, so GP and hospital data. Um, and we're heavily reliant on um, data access contracts and trust in the researcher in order to, I guess, um, govern uh, the system. And the idea is that anyone that's um, that has um, broken the terms and conditions of their contract when they have done something uh, bad, bad actors are sanctioned uh, when they breach their terms and conditions. But I always ask, how would you know? <laughs> how would you know that a researcher has either given unauthorized access to someone else or that has, you know, done something like taken a copy of the data or something? Um, so, yeah. In federated um, data networks, um, the difference is that only the study statistician, usually at that organization, um, as I said, has access to the data and only they can run the, the analysis on that data. And so this is um, has a higher level of, I guess, um, suitability for higher sensitive data sets. And similarly in Data Shield, the researcher can work on all of the individual um, patient data, but they can never view it. 
they can never copy it and they can never print it. So they can use it with full efficiency for their analysis, but because they can't view it, copy or print it, that's what makes it suitable for higher sensitive data sets. So finally, in terms of the experience for the researcher, um, I think some of the biggest some of the biggest experiences are the delays. Um, the the biggest impacts are the delays that researchers experience um, during um, analyses. Um, so, for example, whilst waiting for manual checks to be done on outputs before they can be exported from the environment, um, but also you've got to think if you're an, if you're an analyst that's um, trying to do a meta analysis on say 20 or 25 cohort studies each of these could be using a completely different tre completely different environment you're going to have to log on you're going to have to get approval from all of them separately you're going to have to log on to all of them separately and you're going to have to run your analysis separately at each site um, and so there's a time delay in the actual physical analysis side as well as the disclosure checking side in federated analysis networks it's similar as well you know um you have to wait for the analyst, the statistician to return your results after they've been checked. Um, the other disadvantage is that because you're not, as a researcher, you're not the one that's running your script, you can't edit your script in real time to take into account, you know, things that you might find in the data when you're doing exploratory data analysis. You might have, uh, once once you've submitted your script to the, to the statistician to run, you have to wait for them to give it all back to you. Uh, with the outputs and then you have to send them the new updated script for them to run um, again and so again this the reality is this round robin <laughs> this going back and forwards uh, to a study if you for example changed the type of modeling you want to do or the type of analysis you want to do it's not really feasible when you're looking at 20 to 25 or more cohorts um, in your analysis it really does start to slow things down so in data shield yeah, the researcher can conduct their own analysis. You can change your script in real time. Uh, you can update your statistical methodologies that you're going to use with the data in real time. And, um, and we've mentioned already these um, real time disclosure checks, real disclosure checks. And so this is kind of like uh, maybe uh, solving this issue when if the modern way of working in collaborative science, where we were having to work in larger and larger collaborations in order to get access to um, larger data sets, basically, across individuals. So um, the status of data shield at the moment is that um, we have built, by we, the UK data shield team, um, has built the base functions of data shield. Um, and uh, I guess if to use an analogy of R, these are the, the equivalent of R base. Um, package. There's around 140 functions that allow you to do exploratory analysis, so like frequency, means, GLM, and things like that. Data shaping functions or reshaping functions, changing variable classes, subsetting, etc. And then there's some graphical outputs as well, like histograms, box plots, uh, contour plots, and, 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 and things as well. Um, and we also maintain and develop the core disclosure checking um, softwares as well that can be then inserted into any newly built function. And um, we've also written a series of functions to help developers, a package to help developers, um, because, uh, and these, what these do is these provide disclosive information in the outputs um, to, so that you can actually test your functions are working properly um, uh, uh, whilst you're in development. Uh, most recently, actually, just um, a few weeks ago, we've added um, a mediation package that we also maintain. And the rest of these packages have been built by essentially the data shield community. So we are now uh, an open source software project, and there are other um, organizations and teams around um, mostly Europe that are developing all these different other uh, packages for functionality that they need for their research. So um, I guess. So, yeah, so in green are the packages that we maintain that have been fully audited for disclosure control and also they've been uh, strongly code test, the software has been tested with standard um, different suites of uh, testing that we use in software development. Um, in orange, I'm going to show now some um, libraries and their uses of uh, packages that are currently undergoing testing. So these have either done all of the code testing or they're undergoing their statistical audit testing, but they're somewhere 
somewhere in the process of becoming um, fully audited packages. So there's um, libraries for exposome analysis. There's someone has built a library to help um, analysts to run the data research. Um, there's um, a library for building uh, COX and survival models. Um, there is an omics analysis package, which includes GWAS, um, DGE and EWAS. And there's a number of deep learning and federated, uh, federated learning um, packages as well, uh, also there. Um, so we've got um, one for synthetic data generation as well. And then in yellow, we have, um, I guess, uh, packages that are at a lesser stage of development. So they've only been uh, uh, tested on synthetic data, whereas all of the orange and green ones are basically used in uh, used with real world data at the moment, but aren't fully tested. Um, and these include uh, basically functions for different uh, machine learning statistical methods and also um, geospatial analysis packages as well. And finally, in red, we've got um, some functions and libraries that are, have only just started being developed. Um, there's a wrapper function for some ecological analysis, and there's another second um, synthetic data generation package, uh, as well as a cluster analysis package as well. And so this slide gives you a flavor of the functionality that is available in DataShield um, and what is currently in the pipeline for development. Um, and you can see, like, I guess, um, how uh, broad the community is as well in terms of its interest. Uh, we're starting to go beyond um, just sort of like, I guess, health data as well. So um, my last few slides, I'm going to just go through some of the, I guess, uh, larger consortium use cases of DataShield. So who's been using it? Um, and then also summarize how you can get involved if you're interested in the project as well. So um, over the last uh, maybe four years, we've had a huge increase in the number of large consortia, um, particularly European consortia that are using DataShield as their um, access analysis platform. Um, and I guess one of the things that's also changed is that I guess maybe up to five years ago, um, these consortia were just users of DataShield. They would use the DataShield platform, whereas now consortia are coming and they're using DataShield and then they're starting to become developers and starting to build um, software for DataShield. And so in that way, it's being used as this development, uh, a development platform as well for those research groups um, to develop new libraries to help um, people in their specific uh, research domain as well. So one of the largest networks is um, the Horizon funded, Horizon 2020 funded You Can Connect network. And that's a, a mega, a mega consortium of 173 European cohort studies. Um, and the aim of that um, particular project is to build a fair infrastructure for, uh, for metadata, for harmonization, for access and the analysis of data. And so um, Data Shield is um, the federated analysis platform for that consortium. Um, Athletes, a large, um, another large Horizon 2020 funded project um, led by um, IS Global in Barcelona. And this particular consortium is focused on developing the next generation tools uh, for exposome analysis. Um, so they have been um, leading on the development of the federated um, omics data analysis um, packages um, that are built on top of the data shield platform. Um, Miracum is a fairly large uh, German national project that has been using data shield for a number of years now. Um, it started out as um, a data shield was going to be deployed for federated analysis, I think in eight um, research, research hospitals in Germany to be used with um, electronic record data. There's now plans um, to extend this further to other German research hospitals as well. One of our most recent, um, I guess, larger consortia that has set up is the Uncover Consortia. And they're using data shield across four continents to analyze COVID-19 pandemic data in the area of long COVID research. Um, and they're planning to extend um, the data shield analysis into other data types, such as image data, and also um, they have an interest in respiratory diseases generally. 
the one that I haven't put up here that I forgot to add was um, the NF NFDI for Health project, which is um, another German national project, the National Research Data Infrastructure for Public Health Data. Um, so Data Shield um, is also included in that project. So my last slide. So I hope that you have um, uh, followed my whistle stop tour of Data Shield <laughs> and the infrastructure diagrams haven't been too uh, boring. Um, but I hope that I've shown that there's um, an active and also very diverse data community. Um, we've grown from um, a standalone research project, which was just literally two universities uh, writing some software uh, to an open source multi-stakeholder community. And um, we're in the process uh, that Simon well knows of establishing our governance and constitution of this fledgling open source community. Uh, it's a learning curve, I think, for all of us. Um, but we need to do this to ensure the software sustainability for all the users that are using it and becoming those that are reliant on it now. Um, and to ensure that we've got continuity of services and consistency of the software um, for all stakeholders. So if anyone wants to join us, um, we are an open community um, and you can find out more in two ways. Other than asking Simon, <laughs> you can, you can um, join our forum. It's free, so it's datashield.org forward slash forum. Um, and here you can basically search the historical forum for free for stuff other people have posted or answers to your queries, but you can also post as well. And so you, um, we've got a whole suite of um, stakeholders from developers, people that um, host Data Shield for researchers to use and lots of researchers themselves. And so you can ask uh, you know, questions from people that have been using it. Um, this forum is also our primary news channel. Um, and so all the project updates, project news about new releases of the soft, various softwares, security notices, et cetera, they all happen in this forum. The second way to participate is um, at our annual conference or one of our workshops. And currently we are planning our 2022 conference, which will be the 19th to the 21st of October. Um, it's undecided yet whether we're hosting this um, in person or whether we're hosting it online, but the um, information will be posted in the forum, in the news section. Um, so yeah, so I have now finished my talk um, and hopefully I've shown that um, Data Shield is a, modern um, technological solution uh, for this uh, collaborative team science problem. Thank you.